guys, Mr. Klein here with our last chapter for the sixth grade comprehensive curriculum of social studies on the Renaissance of Reformation and the Age of Explorers. We're going to hit these three big things as the Middle Ages come to a close in this chapter. So hang on and buckle up for about 300 years of crazy history up to and including some of the greatest inventors of our time, some of the greatest painters, uh, people finding new worlds that existed all this time, and a king being thrown out of windows. So let's go ahead and let's get started with the Renaissance, which is the first of our three topics. Now, uh, at the end of our last chapter, we talked about the Black Death, which killed about one-third of Europe's population. And this was really a turning point in European history. The feudal system was in trouble. Uh, universities were starting to expand on knowledge, but more importantly, one out of every three people in Europe died in four years. Despite the Black Plague killing off so many people, it left a whole lot of things alone. For example, the Black Death didn't kill crops. The crops still grew. Ships weren't destroyed, even though they didn't have people to man them. Buildings were still there, even though people didn't live there. Machines uh, and plows and things like that were still there, even though they didn't have a lot of people to operate them. Or money was still there, even though they didn't have a lot of people to spend it. As a result, these things, these really important things that keep an economy going and a civilization were still left intact by the Black Plague. As a result, survivors were able to use this to make Europe's economy grow. One of the things before the Black Death was the connection between Asia and Europe that started to grow. Before the Crusades, the Middle East and Asia used Europe as pretty much a backwater. It was a bunch of ignorant people. They were devoted to their religion. They just kind of farmed and they didn't do much else of worth. However, interactions with the Crusades saw that the Europeans actually had something to offer. And for the Europeans... Asia sure had a lot to offer, and some new products, especially spices and silk and things like that, appeared in markets once again as new goods from the Silk Road brought them from China, which for a couple of hundred years had been closed uh, to outsiders, but when the Mongols took over in the 1200s and 1300s, opened back up. The Europeans really caught on to this because of a traveler named Marco Polo. Okay, let's do it right now. This guy, Marco, that's right, Marco Polo, spent 20 years traveling throughout Asia and China. And he wrote a book about his travels, how he even became an advisor to Kublai Khan, who was the head of the Mongol Empire. And he left Venice, Italy, traveled through Asia, spent time, went down near India, and worked his way back to Italy, where he wrote a book about his, his travels. He spent all this time in China and Asia and looking about it. And even though his book does have some problems with accuracy and things like that, the popularity of, of somebody going out in these weird places and meeting weird people was so much that it inspired traders to seek Asian markets, and in particular, all their riches. The trade from the Silk Road, of course, brought the Black Death, but it did arrive with a lot of goods. And in particular, it arrived in Italy. In particular, four cities, which became really important in the Renaissance. First one was Florence, or Fiorentina in Italian, Genoa, Milan, and Venice, or Venezia. Okay? These four cities that I have squared right here are the four engines of the Italian Renaissance, which there was a northern Renaissance also, but we're not going to really go into it in this lesson. But in particular, you had two port cities. You had Venice and you had Genoa, and you had two inland cities of Milan and Florence. And we're going to focus on Florence right here. All four of these cities are really important. Milan is pretty much considered after Rome to be the most important city in uh, Italy uh, because of manufacturing, things like that today. Florence is still important. Venice is world famous, and Genoa is still a famous port. And these cities were also manufacturing centers, which made their own goods for trade. And we're going to particularly pay attention once again to Florence right here. Kind of in the middle of the northern part of Rome as the peninsula goes down uh, north of Rome, but south of Milan, Venice, and Genoa. As a result, things that were manufactured up in the north generally had to pass through Florence on the way to Rome. Now, at this time, the government uh, was a bit different uh, than 
what you might think. You might think of kingdoms and knights and things like that. In Florence and a lot of the Italian city-states, they had uh, republics. Florence had a government which was based on nine men who ruled on a council of nine of the wealthiest men, and two of them would rule at a time whose names were pulled at random. And Florence became so important mainly because of a banking system that had become used all over Europe. Okay, one of the first modern banks was in Florence, Italy. In Florence, the banks were controlled by the Medici family. And in Florence, like I said, the richest people controlled it. As a result, the rich families in Italy controlled the government. And the Medicis controlled the uh, Fiorentine government. And in particular, a gentleman by the name of Cosimo de' Medici. Okay, Cosimo de' Medici, okay, to use my terrible Italian accent for a second, uh, was the first of a long line of rulers of the Medici family to rule Florence. And the Medici family became really influential. You had a pope, including uh, Pope Leo X, who was the last pope who was not a priest. He was a cardinal at the age of 13. And he, got in tr uh, he really didn't like a guy named Martin Luther, which we'll talk about the next lesson. Uh, one of his descendants also became the Queen of France. And you had a couple other nobles in there. And they stayed in power for around 500 years. So after the Black Death, Cosimo de' Medici comes to power. Cosimo de' Medici was really, really wealthy, and he wanted to make Florence not just a center of banking and political power, but a center of art, literature, and culture, because he really appreciated the arts. He was so wealthy that he spent so much of his money that he kept on making in investments, but also paying for artists to make works of art. And as a result, he was one of the first real patrons of the arts. And this love of art and literature was the key to the time period known as the Renaissance, uh, which means a time of rebirth, which went from around 1350 to around 1515 when the Protestant Reformation kicks off. So once again, the Renaissance is this time period kicked off by Cosimo de' Medici in Italy that runs for about 150 years. So what was the Italian Renaissance all about? Well, let's talk about these writers and artists. In the Middle Ages, most thinkers in Europe devoted their studies to religious study instead of other topics. Everything worked in the framework of what the Catholic Church believed as theology and how the world worked. As a result, your ways of thinking were pretty much locked into that. However, during the Renaissance, people began to study what we call the humanities, or poetry, literature, and art. Okay, even in college, you can get degrees in the humanities, where you study poetry, literature, art, history and things like that, the liberal arts, if you will. Social studies is considered to be one of the liberal arts. And this emphasis of study on the human achievement and what we discover in the world or what we think about and things that we create is what we call humanism. Okay, Humanism got its kickoff during the Renaissance. It stops, uh, humanist thinkers stop saying, well, everything has to do with religion and God. And even though God and religion was still really important during uh, the Renaissance of humanism, they're like, well, at the same time, humans create all these really cool things. So let's go ahead and let's look at it and celebrate the genius of people. This included studying the writings of the Greeks and Romans. And these are what we call classical writings, which if you remember when I talk about the classical age, the Middle Ages, and the modern era, the classical era were the Greeks and the Romans. Okay, and the Middle Ages was the time period between the classical era and the modern era in the 17 and 1800s. Now, so let's talk about some important writers and some important people there. First off was Dante Alighieri. Okay, Dante Alighieri was an early Italian Renaissance writer, and that's this guy right here. He wrote perhaps the greatest work of Italian history, uh, literature, uh, who wrote in Italian, which was the language of the common people, instead of Latin. He wrote it for people in Italy to read and understand it. He wrote a, a series of poems which is called the Divine Comedy. Now, it's not comedy as in funny, but it's a, a writing style. And in Dante's Divine Comedy, he talks about his trip from hell to purgatory and to heaven. And in the process, he really looks at the thinking of St. Thomas Aquinas and their view of the world. And it's considered to be a great work of literature and its writing and also a great work of explaining St. Thomas Aquinas's thinking, if you remember from the last chapter. Another famous writer was this guy, Niccolo Machiavelli. Okay, once again, to use my terrible Italian accent. Machiavelli was this guy. 
he was an Italian thinker, he was an Italian writer, and he was an Italian political scientist. He thought about thinking in government, and he wrote a book on how rulers should govern called The Prince. And according to Machiavelli, rulers should always look out for their own power, and they should always try to preserve their power and do whatever they can to rule by any means necessary. He's famous for making the phrase, it's better to rule by fear than to fear by rule by love, that people will respect power more than they will love. And so this writing, and at the time in Italy, the republics and the kingdoms and all this area, Italy wasn't one country, it was a whole bunch of small countries, were always fighting each other, so Machiavelli's thinking was greatly influenced by this. Now, the term renaissance person or renaissance man refers to people who could do everything well. They were good writers, sculptors, painters, artists, you name it, they could do it. And two of the famous of them are Ninja Turtles. Well, not really Ninja Turtles, but the Ninja Turtles, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, got their names after Renaissance men. And the two most famous are these guys. The first one is Michelangelo, okay? Michelangelo, uh, this guy, here's a drawing of Michelangelo. He was pretty famous. He designed buildings uh, such as St. Peter's Basilica, which is the main church in the Vatican where the Pope worships, okay? He did that. He wrote poetry. He made sculptures uh, such as this, the Pieta, which shows Mary holding Jesus after he was crucified. Okay? Uh, made sculptures and was also a master painter. Okay? Fantastic painter up to and including the Sistine Chapel, which is in the Vatican and shows the Pope I'm sorry, shows Christian theology and the story of the Bible all throughout it. And this right here is the painting of God, which Michelangelo painted upside down while painting the ceiling. The other one was probably the most famous of all of the Renaissance men and people during the Renaissance, and that's Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci, of course, is super famous. Uh for all of his thinking and inventing and things like that. And this is a drawing of Leonardo da Vinci right here. He was, he was an architect, okay? He designed buildings. Uh, he was an inventor. This is his drawing of an airplane. He designed tanks, uh, the pr predecessors of tanks and cars, and all sorts of things like that. He was also an engineer in designing things like that, and also a map maker, including this, map was a hand-drawn map of Imola in Italy to a city and he drew it by hand and through his own measurements and it's super accurate even today uh even you know four or five hundred years later the drawing he made himself was super accurate and also he wasn't too bad of a painter you might have seen this painting before the Mona Lisa which is probably Neil Leonardo da Vinci's famous most famous work so there you go that's the lesson to sum things up the Black Death killed one out of every three Europeans in four years, but the infrastructure of Europe was still left over. People like Marco Polo went to Asia and showed that there were all these new markets and new things that people in Europe should look at. Uh, four cities in Italy kind of started growing through trade in Europe, and the most important was Florence, through the leadership of the De Medici family, uh, in particular Cosimo de de Medici. They were bankers, and they used their money to fund the arts, leading to the renaissance or the rebirth of society. Uh, as a result, the renaissance led to a divergence where people started looking at human achievement through humanism by studying the humanities, poetry, literature, and art. And some famous Italians who lived during the Renaissance and wrote were Dante, who wrote the Divine Comedy, which was considered to be the greatest work of Italian literature, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli wrote The Prince, which was a really famous work on uh, political thought and how uh, kings should rule. Uh, Michelangelo. Michelangelo was probably the greatest of all painters and sculptors. He designed St. Peter's Basilica and the Sistine Chapel, which includes the paintings of Christian theology. Perhaps the greatest thinker was Leonardo da Vinci who was a famous engineer and inventor who created things that 500 years later we only figured out. He was also a talented map maker with uh, maps that were accurate even 500 years later, and also perhaps the most famous painting of all the Renaissance, which was the Mona Lisa. So there you go. That's your lesson. As always, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know, and thanks for watching.